Okay, this is the fiscal equivalent of speed dating. Uh, five <laughs> plans. No, no. Each of them scored roughly by the auspices of Peterson, the Tax Policy Center, and Barry Anderson, so that we can actually compare their visions for the government, for how much they would do in revenues, for what they would do in spending. Um, it's actually, Doug Elmendorf said this morning that the art of this uh, economics is recognizing trade-offs. And what the Peterson Foundation has done here is force the five think tanks that are represented up here to illustrate their trade-offs. And it would be nice if uh, a year from now or 18 months from now, we could look at the presidential platforms and, and compare them as nicely as these plans could be compared. Now, uh, as I said, it's speed dating. We have 35 minutes. So fortunately, the Peterson Foundation has given you all copies of the thing. So <laughs> if you really want to discuss the chain CPI, you could read the fine print later or tackle uh, someone afterwards. We're not going to get to that level of detail, but I hope we can at least frame the issues. I'm joined here by Doug holtz eakin of the American Action Forum, uh, Jason Grummet of the Bipartisan Policy Center, Alan Viard of the American Enterprise Institute, Neera Tandon of the Center for American Progress, and Josh Bivens of the Economic Policy Institute. And I want to start with the slide that we have up on the screen. Uh, you can see it down here. And it's a wonderful illustration of two points. One is that all five of these think tanks from left to right uh, apparently believe we're on an unsustainable course because you can see there's a lot of distance between the black dot current policy and the colored dots for each of the five plans. Um, but they actually come to quite different conclusions. And uh, if you look, uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center, for instance, shows uh, the debt to GDP ratio one of the better measures we have, roughly stable over time, while the American Action Forum uh, takes us way down to, I think, 16% uh, of uh, GDP by 2040. So Jason, I thought maybe I could start with you. How did you guys decide that that's what you wanted your endpoint to be, or did it just fall out of your other policies? So first of all, nice to be here among friends. Um, you know, I think we believe that there are some really kind of self-evident truths, progressive and conservative, on stage. And I think when you reconcile those political realities, um, we came out with what was essentially that balanced line. It was not the desire for flat, although I think more important than any particular number, it is finding something that's sustainable. But I guess the way we would probably describe the three dimensions, um, we believe that fundamentally the government is going to maintain the commitment to provide health care coverage for the poor and the elderly and the disabled. We do not believe that we're going to um, have taxes go up above 22%. And we believe that when you have an overloaded uh, airplane, you don't take the engines off to save weight. We think we're going to have to continue to actually invest in infrastructure and education and R&D. And when you um, accept those three boundary conditions, uh, we think you find yourself at roughly 75%. And I think if you look into the plan, you'll note that we um, have one assumption that I think is distinct from others on stage, which is that we believe we're going to be spending more money on health care in 2035 than the other organizations here. Um, my fear is that that's because we did a bottom up and not a top down. And in my experience, the more you know about something, the less optimistic you get. And we actually believe <laughs> that with a series of um, assumptions which are heroic compared to today's politics, we can actually level uh, spending, reduce it slightly on Medicare while adding 20 new million people to the rolls but do not uh, have Doug's confidence that we can do that while cutting costs significantly. Yeah, so Doug, you, you have the most aggressive plan, and, and, and Jason's absolutely right. One of the reasons you do it is that you take health spending to 4.5% of GDP. It's Civil War era. Right, which is <laughs> substantially below any of the others. So Federal, federal spending. Federal spending on health care. So first of all, why, is it so, why do you think it's so important to get the debt to GDP ratio so far down, to have so much restraint on spending, as you outline in the plan? So it, it, the number isn't important. 16% is not important. You, know, you budget for your problems. We have three big problems. One's growth. We have some aspects of this should improve long-term growth. The second is the sustainability of the social safety net. We do actually have to fix Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. They're not financially sustainable. And the third one's a democracy problem. Uh, right now, we have so much of the budget on autopilot that in a, in a democracy, there's no room for initiatives. We've created the room for a democracy to function again, and that's really what the tight controls on spending do. 
So what? So your plan is to cut spending enough so they can increase spending on something else? They may. In, the in, a, in a representative democracy, they may. But I don't see why we should pre-commit to a path that gives them no options. I see. Um, now, Nira, uh, there are people on the left who argue that uh, fixing the debt isn't the answer to every problem that faces us. And that at a time when we still are somewhat shy of full employment, when there is the gov federal government is borrowing at extraordinarily low interest rates, when there seems to be widespread agreement, one of the few things on which there is agreement that we aren't investing enough in infrastructure, why should we even be worried now about reducing the, the debt, reducing the deficit? Well, I, I mean, in some ways, uh, I agree with the premise to some degree. I mean, our plan, the plan we put forward, wraps up investments uh, in the first few years. We, we do believe that the country faces a challenge around shared prosperity. Uh, median incomes are stagnant, wages are stagnant. Um, these are real profound challenges, not just for individual families, but for economic growth over the long term. So in our view, uh, we should invest uh, in infrastructure now. We should actually address the, the kind of wage squeeze people are feeling from stagnant wages and rising costs. Uh, we feel that we can actually address some of those challenges. Now, uh, we also feel that you can walk and chew gum, and over the long term, we can make sensible decisions to put us in a path towards a, a stable debt-to-GDP ratio. We're a little bit more aggressive than some others on this on this um, on this stage, but we believe that you know sensible policymaking would recognize our challenges now and commit to long-term solutions that will give us more wiggle room. Um, but you know, the difference between Doug and myself is I think, uh, I think people are struggling right now in this economy. I think we've, we have a challenge, which is we have broad economic growth. We all probably think it could be better, but the economic growth we have is really polarized. It is moving to the top. And we have to figure out a strategy, again, not to do the morally right thing, but we believe the economically right thing to ensure that prosperity is more shared in our economy. Okay, I want to get to the inequality and mobility questions a little later. Um, Josh, when you look at those lines on the chart about the debt, you actually end up bringing the debt to GDP ratio lower than either the Bipartisan Policy Center or uh, AEI. So what is your case for why we should do this? and why it's as important as you apparently think it is to bring the, the debt down at a time when we have all the problems that Nira just outlined. Well, uh, on this one, I'm actually going to echo Doug a little bit. I mean, there is no magic in that endpoint number. Um, basically, the exercise, what we're doing here is, what do you think revenues and outlays should be if the economy is on a full employment path going forward? And the full employment path is a really important part of it. If, we, if our plan ended up quite a bit above that, it was at 55% debt to GDP ratio, because we had to have a lot of room for fiscal stimulus in coming decades, we should have fiscal stimulus in coming decades. And so I think the end point is not the real issue. To, for us, sustainability is if the economy is at full employment, the debt to GDP ratio should be stable or on a very slight downward path. Um, and so that, that is sort of the guiding principle. And since we're assuming full employment throughout this exercise, you get some progress there. I think whether or not we get to full employment is a real question over the next 10 years or so. I think there's real questions about it, which is why we have such a strong kind of balanced budget multiplier approach in our budget. So even as you're bringing revenues and outlays closer together, you raise revenues progressively, you do more spending, and you can actually have the deficit close, but still get a macroeconomic boost. Hmm. Um, Alan, I'm gonna switch a little bit. One of the, there are a number of interesting themes in the, in the budgets that you all have provided some of which uh, highlight the contrast in your approach and some of the similarities. And I want to talk a little bit about the interest in changing the way we tax energy. Why, what, explain a little bit about what your plan was in the AEI plan and why does that seem to be such something that pretty much everybody or, or most of you have in your plans, not everybody? Well, I think that there's a widespread recognition by economists 
and to some extent even among policymakers, that the crazy quilt of regulations and subsidies and tax credits that have been adopted to address energy and environmental problems really don't make sense, that that's an inefficient uh, for, way to address those issues that really ignores market forces. And so there's a pretty broad agreement among economists that pricing carbon through a carbon tax or through a similar mechanism offers a way to harness market forces uh, behind the response to uh, climate change, and the same approach can be used for other environmental problems. And so along those lines, therefore, the AI plan does introduce a small carbon tax, not as a supplement to the existing crazy quilt of other measures, <laughs> but as a replacement uh, for them. Now, we also propose an increase in the gasoline tax to provide financial viability to the Highway Trust Fund. We believe that it makes sense for highway-related spending to be financed by motorists, and so it should be done either through the gasoline tax or through some type of other uh, driving-related charge. And so we really reject some of the proposals out there that would introduce general revenue transfers uh, financed through funding gimmicks as a way to keep the trust fund limping along from month to month. So does anybody want to take the other side of the energy tax question, or are people convinced that that's a logical way to go? You don't have it in your plan, I believe. No, but I, I think Alan's made the right case. If you want to go down that path, you want to uh, use uh, market forces, and the crazy quote is exactly as crazy as he described and has an enormous amount of inefficiencies. Does anybody want to argue against the energy? No, we, should, we can do something together on this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It'll be great. That's why you need to have people of different points of view on the same stage. Exactly. Right? We could, we're this will be the place where done. the budget deal was done. The Allen Yard. <laughs> if it were up to us, the we would be farther the along. The 21st century. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the one thing I would suggest, and I think we've the, done this one, Steve. We've done this together. <laughs> the, the, of course, the problem is that we started the conversation with most economists agree which, of course, is a very quick end to most political conversations. So I think if we're going to... Not to, to mention non-political yeah. conversations. Fair enough. We're, the, the lo, based on the loneliness quotient, we could all be president. Um, <laughs> yes. I think the interesting question, in my mind, is in the context of comprehensive tax reform. Once one goes through everything else, my expectation is there's going to be a couple hundred billion dollars short. They're going to shake hands, they're going to have the broad outlines, and there's going to be a moment where there's a, you know, oh, geez, now we actually got to go tax something. At that moment, I think then this energy conversation, carbon, I think everything else is on the table. Because when you're comparing taxes to taxes, there's a lot to be said for taxing things you don't want, like carbon, and reducing taxes on things you do want, like labor and savings. I think until you get to that moment, I don't think you get to have a serious conversation. So I don't sense, I sense a tremendous amount of very serious energy around corporate tax reform. Mm -hmm. I don't sense any serious political energy around carbon. Let's have this conversation in 2017. 2018, I think we might be in a different place. Right. Well, of course, politics is the art of making the necessary possible, and I think you're right. At some point, they'll get there. Doug, there was a conversation earlier this morning with John Harwood and, and Doug Elmendorf where the question of dynamic scoring came up. Uh, now, the way the Peterson Foundation instructed these things to be scored, there isn't any dynamic scoring. There isn't any economic feedback. But I'm curious whether you think these plans would look very different if we had done the kind of dynamic scoring that CBO and JCT are going to do? Uh, ab absolutely, because if you look at the current policy path with the, the debt spiral that we're headed into, um, you're, you're basically saying to uh, anyone who wants to invest in America, expand in America, hire in America, that your future consists of one of three things. Uh, it's either going to be we do nothing and we have a sovereign debt crisis, or we are going to try to tax our way out of this problem and you're never going to make a reasonable rate of return. Now, that's 0 for 2 on growth. Or you will do what everyone on this stage has done. You take on uh, the social safety net to make it sustainable and, and not bankrupt America. And then you know, you've said to the world and to the world's investors, we are going to be a place that's going to be good for growth. That has to have a big impact. It's the main reason to get the debt on a downward trajectory, to take that fear just out of the equation forever. But do you think the numbers in here, the feedback would be so great that the numbers would look really different? If, we, if you were scoring it dynamically? A define really different. Um, Percentage uh, point of GDP. An apocalypse in 2038 <laughs> versus... No, no, but if I'm comparing these plans, they have different approaches. Oh, oh among different the Different amount of tax, yeah. different amount of spending, different plans on entitlements. So, you know, you can probably move the growth rate um, with a really highly economically efficient and thus politically undesirable plan by three-tenths, four-tenths percentage points tops. And the differences among them are going to be smaller than that. Um, so there's been a lot of conversation here today about investment, and, it, and 
we don't really, we, it's hard to look at these plans and say what your, understand completely what your philosophy is on public investment. One proxy for that is the amount of money in non-defense discretionary spending. Uh, I think uh, the, the Doug, your plan, the AEI plan, and the BPC plan all have slightly less as a percentage of GDP uh, non-defense discretionary, and the CAP and EPI plans have more. I, I want to explore a little bit about how, how, how important is it in the fiscal plan we put together, if we're putting together a 25-year fiscal plan, to plan on spending more money on public investment? Josh, you want to start? Or if it isn't, not important? It, to us, we think it's very important. And, and just to bring it back to your last question on dynamic scoring, that is almost always talked about in reference to what are right. the economic impacts of tax cuts. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to be serious about it, then you should also realize public investment can spur growth and actually try to put an estimate on that as well. And so the way dynamic scoring is usually thought of, it would probably ding the EPI plan pretty much because we raise taxes, but then we also do a lot of public investment and we should get credit for that if that's ever going to be a thing that enters the policy realm. Um, but to my mind, if you look, I, th I think there's a strong link between the decline in public investment as a share of GDP over the past 30 years and what has happened to U.S. productivity growth. I think it was actually obscured for a while when we got that nice productivity boost in the late 1990s and early 2000s. We know where that came from. It mostly came from you know, uh, information technology and communication technology. That's mostly behind us. So going forward from now, what is the really predictable thing we can do to boost productivity growth? To my mind, it's just start doing investment directly. We have a lot of unmet needs. And then I would even just one last thing. Lots of things that are not classified is public investment, you know, Medicaid, food stamps. There's a growing body of research that says, you know, kids who have access to food stamps when they're young grow up to be much healthier. Um, so I think a lot of that sort of non-discretionary, um, sorry, non-defense discretionary, as well as even some of our sort of tra uh, social insurance programs really can have a big boost in the long run. Alan Viar, do you think we're, we should be investing more, and do you think we have the capacity to invest the money as wisely as Josh suggests? Well, the latter, I think, is the key issue. We all agree that public investment can be play an indispensable role, and there's no question that infrastructure is a legitimate function of government. And Adam Smith listed it as one of the uh, legitimate functions of government back two centuries ago, and so I think there's really a consensus on that. Now, some of that investment should be done at the state government level, some of it should be done at the federal government level, but it's always a challenge, I think, to make sure that the investment is productive. Investment that's done by private firms need, meets a marketplace test. On the other hand, investment that's done in the public sector obviously is filtered through the political process. And if we look at history, we find some public investments that were very wise and very productive and some investments uh, that weren't. So we think we do need to keep the resources available so that we can do the investments that are needed, that are productive, and that are appropriately done at the federal level. But at the same time, I think we should recognize that non-defense discretionary is a very broad category. It includes a lot of programs that are not investment-oriented in nature and some investments that are probably not very well thought out. So careful priority setting is really key in this area, as in so many others. So I, I think, you know, again, um, I think we can look at public investment as a, as a category and how it relates to the economy, or you can take it in a kind of more specific nature. and. In our, in our view, we, we do think families today uh, have a particular challenge with um, the squeeze of stagnant, stagnant wages and rising costs. And uh, a number of those rising costs are actually in areas which are really important for us to address as a country. So higher education. Um, now, you're absolutely right. We can spend our higher education dollars more efficiently and effectively. But it's also, you know, we should also recognize that most countries in the world, higher education is free <laughs> or much more subsidized than in the US. And that has an effect on their social mobility in a way that is a challenge for us. So to my mind, you know, we're trying to think through investments that address some of the stresses on families that can also redound to economic benefit over the long term as well as in the immediate term. And I think that's a way to think about some of these public investments. Because you're absolutely right, there are a number of things the government does that aren't particularly related. But in our fear of, of inefficient spending, I think sometimes we, we uh, stop ourselves from making just most investments that all of us could agree on, just like infrastructure. 
Uh, Jason, you said uh, earlier that you expect us to spend more on health care than some of the others and than we do now. I wonder if you could talk about it a little bit. So my premise is we start from an interesting place on health care now. We have, <laughs> like it or not, the ACA. We've covered more people. Uh, we've had a slowdown in the annual rate of growth of health care. How persistent it is, we don't know. And we know that that really matters to the out years. Mm -hmm. but. Um, it's imprudent to, it seems to me, to count on the slow growth lasting forever. It's imprudent also to s assume that it's going to pick up to where it was. So given that uncertainty, what would you do to federal health spending and why do you think it's so important to increase more than the other people on the panel do? Um, so I guess I would um, kind of play with the end of your quote there a little bit, which is um, it's not that we think it is important to increase it. We think it is unrealistic to imagine you know, hope not being a strategy, that we should just draw the line we want and assume it'll happen. And I think our experience with... Hope the, isn't a strategy? This is why you could never run for president. The experience with the doc hope, fix, I think... It's like hope is actually a strategy. Right? It's just not a good one. It's a political strategy. <laughs> but I mean, you know, I think we should look at the example of the doc fix, both in all of its gore and in recent possibility, right? So what we said 20 years ago was, hey, we're going to cap it without really a plan for how we would achieve that. And then every year, we'd shovel money back in. And so I think that's our fear, was we don't want to come up with an arbitrary number that makes us feel good and makes our numbers look good without a real plan to get there. Um, but I think we do have some optimism, and it's a combination of substantive and political. And I'll go back to, um, and I think uh, Leader McCarthy talked about this, the you know, permanent doc fix, which is the geekiest thing. I mean, why we're all lonely and worst thing you ever want to raise in public conversation is actually for us a moment of inspiration. Why do you keep saying we're all lonely? We are. We are. I mean, I you know, John Harbour, when we were walking out, said that he thought this was an example of um, Survivor and one of us get voted off the island. And for those of you who know the Discovery series Naked and Afraid, I think it's probably a more apt um, example. But to the substance of your question, what Congress just did was actually create incentives for networks of care in which physicians who are you know, basically caring for people and getting better outcomes are being paid more than folks who are just moving people through tests. So we've actually had the first example of an actual shift away from fee-for-service and towards outcome. We think you can build on that. They just actually removed some of the kind of incentives for you know, first dollar coverage. So now everyone's got a little bit of skin in the game. This is a key idea we've all talked about. We think you can build on that. And they brought some means testing into the public reimbursement. Um, those are the three ideas that I believe most of us probably think are probably the right ways to go. And we've driven all those really hard, and we've done a bunch of studies, and we've done an insane amount of economic analysis. Um, we should all invest in these companies. Um, and the best we can get is 9%, because we're adding 20 million new people to the system. And so you know, I think it's possible to reduce the per capita investment and still provide quality care. We just don't want to reduce the capita because that'd be bad quality care. And so I think if you acknowledge that the baby boom is retiring today, so this idea that we have this runway and we, can, we, got, we have no more time to figure this out, right. um, these are the best numbers that we can... So Doug, what would you do differently that would allow us to spend much less money on healthcare? So um, one is a, just a strategy, right? We, we would acknowledge that we are aggressively trying to uh, do what things like the doc fix didn't do, which is have incentives to reduce the price of healthcare and not yeah. just the utilization. Um, so strong sets of incentives, competitive bidding incentives, things that have worked in, in the Part D program, for example. Um, uh, I agree completely with the idea of let's, let's pay for a bundle of care, hold people to a quality metric. That's, that's the right strategy. We've set out to drive it harder than, than Jason thinks is possible. And I'm willing to ima uh, imagine that we're wrong, but we have room in our plan to be wrong. You don't want to write down a plan where if you were wrong on the upside, and historically we spend more than many plans say we will, or you're wrong on the taxes, and historically we tax less than many plans say we will, you're in trouble, and, and we're not going to be in trouble. So okay. can, can I just, I just want to say one thing, which is I think it's, I would be, it would be remiss to not acknowledge how much health care savings we have actually gotten. Um, I think policymakers kind of glide over this. It is a substantial difference in the budget picture. We're talking like a trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. And I completely appreciate the conversation we're having about 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now. But if we, we were in this room 10 years ago or five years ago or four years ago, not a single person would have believed that these numbers are anything close right. to it. Right. Or so possible. Just, so this is just, just let the, me this add, is... that's, that's true, this, the CBO projections have changed, but 
I, I'm a CBO director who lived through explaining where did the seven trillion dollars in surplus go. So I wouldn't count I can on that tell being you, there. Doug, would you like me I wouldn't to tell count you on that what being policies there. Drive I can them? tell you too, but but you just can't count on those. All right. So we have a few minutes left, and I don't want to uh, close without getting to the mobility question. There seems to be uh, a, a surprising to me consensus in Washington now that we don't have as much intergenerational mobility as we would like. We'd like it to be easier for people to run, rise from poverty to the middle class. So I wonder if each of you could speak briefly about what in your plan, if anything, would increase the odds that a poor kid can make it to the middle class. Do you want to start, Josh? I think the biggest part in our plan is just the, the amount of money we're spending on the non-defense discretionary allows for an enormous increase in things like universal high quality pre-K, which is an enormously high return investment. Um, and that, that's, we're putting you know, resources there. I mean, one of the big reasons why you've seen this big rise in inequality is associated with just stagnant mobility in the United States. If you just look at what parents spend on their kids in terms of educational resources, you can actually look at this. And you know, rich parents have a lot more money to spend on education and enrichment, right. and so you have to have government level that playing field, and we provide the resources to actually do that. Nira? So uh, we have uh, universal pre-K, we also have college access, which is a huge, uh, hugely important issue. Uh, we do things that are not in the budget context around profit sharing, other ideas to actually ensure wages go up uh, as uh, for most people. So uh, I think we're really, we're really focused on this challenge, not over, just over the long term, but how families are facing it right now. Alan? Mobility. So our tax reform uh, tries to address this by moving to a progressive consumption tax, and both elements of that are important, the progressivity and the consumption basis. The progressivity ensures that there's not an undue financial obstacle being placed on low-income households that are trying to get ahead. At the same time, the consumption-based nature of the tax should deliver a jolt to investment over the long term. A dynamic, growing economy with new businesses being created uh, is exactly the prescription that's needed to allow everybody to get ahead. Jason? So even if we stay within the tired walls of our existing um, tax system, we certainly can make it much fairer and much more efficient. I think we all recognize that the significant uh, tax deductions right now tend to favor those who have significant incomes, um, so whether it's mortgage interest reduction or the you know, Cadillac tax, um, we think there's room there. And then I'll just tee up Doug by saying immigration reform. <laughs> Doug. So um, agree with him on the tax reform. We have a very similar one. Uh, we, we do have an immigration reform. Immigration is a, a pro-growth opportunity for the United States. Uh, it's also an opportunity for the middle class because uh, immigrants are disproportionately entrepreneurial and they're gonna start those businesses that have been missing in this recovery, the new ones that hire people, allow them to get ahead. But I think it's also imperative to recognize that you know, the difference between success and failure in the United States is work. And, and if you're gonna be poor, you don't work. And if you work, you're not gonna be poor. So have all of our social safety net be pro-work. And then within work, those with high skills do better. And, and what, what has been said about the, the sort of educational system making it work, not, not all of it's money, but, but we need to do a much better job. Good, okay, I'm afraid we're out of time. Please join me in thanking the panelists. <laughs> and we, we really just were able to get the top half inch of the plan, so I really encourage you to look at them and the very nice comparisons that the Peterson Foundation has put together in the booklet. Thank you very much.